Good morning, everyone. This is Lesson 2, Radioactive and Radiocarbon Dating, Turning Foe into Friend. And this is the second lesson of Series 4 on Creationism versus Evolution. Next week, we will have Lesson 3 called Evolutionary Inaccuracies. And then the final lesson of the final Series 4 will be Dangers of Evolution, Impacts on the World and Church, and try to summarize some of these talks as well. The outline, we'll talk about the basis of radioactive dating, talk about three assumptions of radioactive dating, look at the Rate Research Project and how they came up with five evidences for a young Earth, and then show how we're going to turn this foe of radioactive and radiocarbon dating into friend. First, we'll give an outline, the basis of radioactive dating, kind of a chemistry 101. Each element is made up of atoms with the same unique number of electrons and protons. The number of neutrons can vary in each atom, and the atoms of each element with different neutron numbers are called isotopes. Some atoms and some elements have too many neutrons in their nuclei, so they are unstable isotopes. As we look at carbon-12, it has an equal number of protons and neutrons, six each. Carbon-13 has six protons, seven neutrons, but when we get to carbon-14, it has two more neutrons and eight neutrons versus six protons, and it means it's unstable. These unstable isotopes may decay by ejecting some of their subatomic particles so as to become stable. The result, they turn into a different element, and elements are defined by the number of protons and neutrons. Looking at the periodic table of ele elements, we see carbon is uh, in its atomic weight is 12, and then nitrogen is right next to it, and it's 14. And we'll show later that carbon... 14 will radioactively decay to nitrogen. So the basis of radioactive de dating, this process is known as radioactive decay. A Geiger counter is used to detect radioactive elements such as carbon-14 or uranium. And decaying isotopes are the same as radioactive isotopes or radioisotopes for short, and that's what I'll be talking about. When I'm talking about radioisotopes, it's decaying isotopes. And decaying radioisotopes eventually result in a stable isotopes of different elements. And decaying radioisotopes, there are parent isotopes like carbon-14 or uranium. And then the stable isotopes that it turns into are daughter isotopes like nitrogen or lead. And minerals, rocks, and fossils contain some of these parent and daughter isotopes. And like I mentioned, carbon is a parent isotope, and it'll turn into nitrogen, which is the daughter. And here's the example I just referenced. And then also we have uranium will turn into lead, and potassium will decay into argon, daughter isotope, and parent isotope rubidium will turn into daughter isotope strontium. So if a rock, the basis of radioactive dating, if a rock is chemically tested for these isotopes, there's a key assumption. The rate of radioactive decay has a remained constant at today's rate. And the rock's, ages, the rock's age is calculated by how long the daughter isotope or atoms have accumulated. They start at the parent isotope, and just think of like an hourglass and sand falling through it, that's the radioactive decay mechanism. And the time it takes to fill up the bottom of the hourglass, but in case of radioactive dating, it takes a lot longer time. When it fills up the bottom, then that's your transfer from parent to daughter in the radioactive decay mechanism. Here's a short video talking about what I just explained. <laughs> Nearly every textbook in science magazine teaches that the Earth is billions of years old, and the primary dating method used for determining this is what is called radioisotope dating, or radiometric dating. Now this is a reliable method for measuring absolute ages of rocks and the age of the Earth, right? Huh. First off, many scientists now regard the age of the Earth to be between 4.55 and 4.6 billion years old. 
Okay. So if this method is reliable and accurate, why the 50 million year discrepancy? And that seems like a lot. But let's get into some details here and see what's going on. Keep in mind, there's all kinds of scientific jargon on this topic, and so we'll just present a very straightforward, simplified version of the process. Radiometric dating is the process of estimating the ages of rocks based on the decay of radioactive elements in them. Basically, there are certain kinds of atoms in nature that are unstable and spontaneously decay into other kinds of atoms. For instance, uranium will radioactively decay through a series of steps until it becomes the stable element called lead. The original element is called the parent element, and the end result is called the daughter element. Radioisotope dating is commonly used to date igneous rocks, rocks which formed when hot molten material cooled and solidified. The dating clock started when the rock cooled. During the molten state, it is assumed that the intense heat forced any gaseous daughter elements to escape. It is assumed that once the rock cooled, no more atoms escaped, and any daughter element now found in the rock is a result of radioactive decay since that rock formed. The decay rate is measured in terms of half-life. That is, the length of time it takes half of the remaining atoms of a radioactive parent element to decay. Now, of course, that can be measured in a laboratory, and it is assumed that since we know the decay rate, we can calculate backwards and come up with the age of the rock. But is that all there is to it? Here's where it gets tricky. It's true we can measure a decay rate using observational science, but there's another kind of science that is required to accurately calculate dates for rocks, and that is what we call historical science. Historical science deals with the things in the past, and therefore it cannot be repeated and tested. Dating methods require both types of science, because in order to get accurate rock dates, one would have to accurately know both the decay rate and the initial conditions of the rock sample, right? Since radioisotope dating uses both types of science, we can't directly measure the ages of rocks. There are assumptions involved. For instance, how do we know what the initial conditions were in a rock sample? How do we know the amounts of parent or daughter elements now in that sample haven't been altered by other processes in the past? How does someone know the decay rate has remained constant since the rock formed? The answer is, they don't. Let's simplify here and talk about a typical hourglass. Let's say you walk into a room and you see an hourglass with sand at the top and sand at the bottom and some sand sprinkling from the top chamber to the bottom. Well, observational science would allow us to see and measure the sand and then calculate how long the hourglass has been running, right? We could make our sand measurements and then calculate when the hourglass was turned over, right? Well, those calculations could be wrong because we may have failed to consider some major assumptions. Like, was there any sand at the bottom when the hourglass was turned over? Has any sand been added or taken out of the hourglass? Has the sand always been falling at a constant rate? Since we did not observe the initial conditions when the hourglass started, and we haven't been watching the sand all the time since then, we must make assumptions. All three of those assumptions can affect our time calculations. Now, of course, there's more to understanding all of this, but enough said. Okay, that, that kind of gives you an idea of a radioactive dating and also talks about the assumptions. And that's what I'm going into right now. The three assumptions of radioactive dating. Assumption one, initial conditions. These are the known amounts of parent and daughter isotopes at the beginning of the decay uh, dating mechanism. The problem is the geologists were not there when the rock formed and you don't know the initial amounts of isotopes or atoms. And what if they were lead atoms with uranium atoms when the rock form, when you're going from uranium to lead, parent to daughter, radioactive decay? The result, inaccurate rock dating. Assumption number two, it, it's assumed that it's a closed system. All daughter atoms measured today in the rock must have been derived from the original parent atoms. But the problem is you can't have contamination in the rock. Like a global, global floodwaters would contaminate the rock sample. And that would result in inaccurate rock dating. And assumption three, constant decay rate. Radioactive decay must remain constant at today's rate from start to finish. The problem is scientists have only been measuring radioactive decay rates in the only in the past 100 years and it assumes the decay rate has remained constant without any interruptions with floods or any other type of mechanism for millions and billions of years the result would lead to inaccurate rock dating here's a short video talking about radioactive decay from unlocking the mysteries of genesis Institute for Creation Research. Secular scientists say with great confidence that the rocks in the Grand Canyon 
are in the inner gorge more than a billion years old and these layered sediments between 270 and 540 million years old. They base these estimates on the decay of radioactive elements like uranium and their measurements of how fast uranium decays into lead and helium in the laboratory. These scientists assume that the rate they measure in the laboratory today has been constant since the Earth came into existence. However, about 10 years ago, some of my colleagues and myself found powerful evidence that the rate that uranium decays has not been constant in the Earth's past, but has been as much as a billion times higher than we measure it to be today. This has profound implications. It means that this assumption that the secular scientists have been using for the last hundred years is wrong. The implication for the rocks in the Grand Canyon is that these rocks are not hundreds of millions of years old, but only thousands of years old. Okay. So the three assumptions of radioactive dating, initial conditions, a closed system, and constant decay rate. None of these assumptions are provable. The past can't be observed, measured, or tested. Therefore, these assumptions are not even reasonable. Daughter atoms may be inherited when the rock forms, like volcanic gases can cause extra argon in the, say, the potassium argon method. And subsequent contamination is common. The Rate Research Project. The RATE stands for Radioisotopes in the Age of the Earth, acronym is RATE. It's an eight-year creationist research project from 1997 to 2005. They concluded that Assumption 3, the constant decay rate, is absolutely false. And they discovered five lines of evidence and demonstrated radioactive decay was rapidly accelerated during the global flood. And radioactive dating cannot accurately date rocks with millions of years of age. And here's a picture and a listing of the rate group. And it ranges from PhD scientists of, in geophysics, atmosp atmospheric physics, nuclear physics, geology, geological engineering, and biology. So a very impressive list of uh, intelligent researchers. Five now, there's five evidences from a young Earth. Evidence number one, helium and zircons. Helium is a byproduct when uranium decays to lead. Every decaying uranium atom produces eight helium atoms. While there was deep drilling near Los Alamos, New Mexico for geothermal energy, during the drilling investigations, they intersected granite. And there's a picture here. And the zircon crystals were recovered from the granite, and they look like this picture here. These zircons contained uranium, lead, and helium. But their supposed uranium lead age is 1.5 billion years old. And the helium retained in these zircons were measured. And they looked at different depths, and which produced different temperatures because it's hotter. Uh, 3,900 meters down into the earth than 750 meters down. And then you also lose helium heating it up. Because helium leaks out of the zircon crystal, if you look at that chart, helium is the second lightest element in the table. It's lightweight, fast moving, and slippery. So the hotter the crystal, the faster the leakage rate with more vibrations, you heat up the helium, it vibrates and moves more and escapes quicker. So zircon helium leakage rates versus temperature. The hotter the zircon, the faster the leakage. So the helium leak rate out of the zircon crystals can be calculated with the leakage rate approximately equal to the helium lost over time. And for time, if you input 6,000 years, which is the creation model, you can come up with a creation leak leakage rate. And if you input 1.5 billion years or the old Earth model, you can come up with a leakage rate for that model as well. 
So the helium retained in these zircons or measured and looked at temperature and helium. If you look at the temperature, the warmest down at near 4,000 meters was 277 Celsius, which is almost twice the boiling rate of water, and the helium dropped down to 0.1%. But near the top, you had almost 80% helium. So this uh, helium leakage rate has never been measured before in science. And the creation scientists decided to graph the 6,000 year uh, rate next and with the 1.5 billion year, the young earth and old earth uh, rates. And the difference is a factor of 100,000 times, meaning 100,000 times faster helium leakage rate for the 6,000 year versus the 1.5 billion year line. And then what they did was they sent these predictions and published them in 2000 without actual evidence. So observations were taken later. They gave the scientific community a heads up saying, we are going to predict that the helium leakage rate will be much faster than what the current dating methods are. And they took a major risk because if they were wrong, uh, it might have been embarrassing. The helium leakage rates in the zircons were measured by a world-class lab at Caltech, so there wouldn't be any concern about the scientific method. The results are astounding. The blue dots from the data, look at this, lie right exactly on the 6,000-year dash plot. The experimental data, when we had... Uh, the experimental data matched the 6,000-year prediction exactly, and the 1.5 billion years prediction was extremely wrong. So based on the measured rates of estimated average leakage age of the helium in the zircons, it came up to an average of 5,680 years or close to 6,000 years, and they sampled five of these zir helium and zircons and based on the temperature they came up with uh, an average year of almost 6,000 years with a different helium percentage loss. And here's a video that kind of summarizes what I just uh, described. Another indication that there's something wrong with the method involves these little crystals called zircons that we find in granite. And within the zircons, you have uranium-238, which is radioactive. And it goes through this multi-step process where that uranium-238 is transformed into lead, a particular isotope of lead. Now, if you look, for instance, at the amount of lead in the zircons, you can figure out how many years of decay that would be at today's rates. And it's about one and a half billion years. So if you're looking at the lead in the zircons, you would conclude that it's about one and a half billion years old. But there's another decay product that occurs in this process, and that's helium. When the uranium turns into lead, you have helium nuclei being produced, basically helium atoms minus the electrons. And so they eventually, along the way, they're going to pick up a couple of electrons and they will become full-blown helium atoms. Well, these helium atoms, they don't react very well with other substances, and it's very easy for it to leak out of the zircons. If these zircons really are one and a half billion years old, why is it that we still see large amounts of helium within the zircons? Because if they're really one and a half billion years old, most of that helium should have leaked out. So here we have a contradiction within a single method. You have two decay products. You've got lead, you've got helium, and they're giving you two different ages for the zircon. And again, how do you resolve that paradox? Well, one way to resolve it would be if the decay rates have changed in the past. Okay, so evidence one, helium in the zircons, as he mentioned, these two uranium decay clocks in the zircons disagree by millions. The helium leakage diffusion clock used by operational science through the scientific method gave a date of 6,000 years. The nuclear de de decay clock is unproven 
uses faulty assumption and disagrees with the helium clock, which was tested through operational science using the scientific method, and disagrees with the helium diffusion clock by millions. Both clocks can only be reconciled if this one, the nuclear decay 1.5 billion years of nuclear decay was accelerated to occur uh, in the 6,000 years of helium diffusion, or this had to be accelerated by 100,000 times, and that occurred during the global flood. Evidence two, different radioisotope ages. There's four major radioisotope dating methods used on rocks, and they are potassium argon, parent to daughter, rubidium strontium, uranium to lead, two different methods, and samarium to neodymium. Geologists usually use one or two of these methods, and they assume all methods produce the same age results for the same rock. Rate used all four radioisotope methods on all rock samples studied to see if they agree with each other. And rate uses the superior isochron method technique where not just analyzing one sample, but they analyzed five to as much as 20 samples in one individual test. So what did they look at? They looked at the Base Rapids Diabase Sill in the Grand Canyon. And after they dated this, they came up with ages of, using the potassium argon method, 841 million years. The rubidium strontium method, 1,060 million years. The lead lead method, 1,250 million years. And the Sumerian neodymium, 1,379 million years. Now we go from 800 to almost 1,400 million years, and they're supposed to all be accurate and close together. This is but significantly different. The second evidence that they looked at was the lava flows in the Grand Canyon, and these are the dating rep, uh, method results. Potassium argon for the basalt gave an age of 516 million years. The rubidium strontium method, 1.1 billion years, and the Sumerian neodymium, one, almost 1 1.6 billion years. So it went from 516 doubled to, over double to 1.1 and over tripled to 1.6. They're not even close in the same ballpark of age. And the third evidence was looking at ancient lava flows. And the ages were from 1.2 billion to 1.8 billion to 1.6 billion. Again, not close at all. And the fourth uh, rate results were the granite in the Grand Canyon and the rubidium strontium method, 1.5 billion, lead lead, 1.9 billion years, and Sumerian neodymium, 1.6 billion years. So again, way off. They're not even close. So multiple radioisotope ages for these four rock units are different, and they always disagree. Each of these rock units represent a unique geological event, like a formation of a sill, a metamorphism of lavas, volcanic eruptions of lavas, and crystallization of a granite. If the radioisotope clocks were accurate, always ticking at the same rates as today, each clock should have given the same age for each rock unit. Therefore, each radioisotope clock must have been ticking at a different faster rate than today to give different ages. Let's pull out one of the examples to demonstrate. Looking at the Cardinius basalt, the potassium argon clock tick rapidly through 516 million years here. Then the rubidium strontium method tick faster through 1.1 billion years, you know, almost double. And then the Sumerian neodymium ticked even faster through 1.6 billion years. So is there a pattern of ages and a factor affecting the accelerated clocks? Well, let's look at some of the evidence. 
the potassium is actually younger than the rubidium. Shorter half-life decays more rapidly and gave a younger age. The alpha process indicated by the A here, the A here for the Bass Rapids diabase sill, and the A here for the uh, Danis uh, basalt, always give older age than the beta process. If no, if random, then there shouldn't be patterns like this. But it fits a pattern, and it's not random. Let's look at the other uh, results in the uh, granite and also in the Brahma amphibolites. The beta rubidium all is always younger than the alpha uranium and samarian. So the beta is younger, younger, alpha, older, older. The alpha processes always give older ages and fits patterns and not random again. So the patterns are the alpha decay ages are always older than the beta decay ages. The longer the present half-life, the older the ages. The patterns, the alpha decay ages are always older. And we see here alpha is older than beta. And the longer half-lifes are older. And heavier atoms give older ages than lighter atoms. So all four radioisotope clocks yield different ages for the same rock. Different ages can be explained if these radioisotope clocks ticked at faster rates in the past and at faster rates than today's measured slow rates. So we can conclude that the different radioisotope ages for the same rocks are evidence of accelerated nuclear decay, matching what we saw in evidence one of the helium clock leaking out of the zircon crystals. And here's a video by Dr. Andrew Snelling who I used a lot of material from to pr produce this lesson. He talks about does radiometric dating prove the Earth is old? Does radiometric dating prove the Earth is old? Does the radioactive dating of rocks prove that the Earth is very old? Absolutely not. We need to understand how these methods work so we can find out the answer to that question. First of all, they're based on the occurrence of radioactive atoms of different elements in rocks. For example, some atoms of uranium decay to lead over time. Atoms of potassium, some atoms decay to argon. Rubidium decays to strontium. And uh, we call them parent atoms decay to daughter atoms. Well, what most people don't realize is that there are three basic assumptions that are always used, and none of these assumptions are either testable or provable. Let's, let's run through these assumptions. Number one, that we know the starting conditions. Well, the geologists assume that there are only uh, parent atoms to begin with. Well, if there were some daughters, they think of ways to, to measure that and figure it out. But really, we don't know because we weren't there to know exactly what the starting conditions were. Number two, they have to assume that all the, the daughter atoms we measure today have to have been derived by radioactive decay of the parent atoms in the rock. But how do we know? What about contamination? What if groundwater flowed through the rocks in the past, adding or subtracting some of the parent or daughter atoms? So that's another problem. And the third assumption is that the rate of decay has always been constant. In other words, we measure how quickly uranium decays to lead today, uh, potassium to argon, and then the, the geologists have assumed that that's the decay rate back into the past. So because uranium decays very slowly, they assume it's always decayed very slowly. Now, that again is not testable because we weren't there in the past to see whether the clocks have always ticked at the same rate. And geologists don't always admit to these problems and recognise them. Now, I was involved in a major research project and we found several lines of evidence that led us to the conclusion that the decay rates were much more rapid in the past, that they were accelerated and therefore the clocks ticked so much faster that the, the millions of years ages telescope right down to short young ages. And so, for example, we took rock samples from the same, uh, the same samples from the same rock layers and subjected them to several of the dating methods all at once. And we got different results for the different dating methods. Now, how could that be? 
Well, we discovered, as we did with several other lines of evidence, that the best explanation, indeed the only explanation, is that the decay rates were faster in the past. So that while the potassium argon clock kicked through 516 million years, the rubidium strontium clock ticked through 1111 million years. And so if the decay rate hasn't been constant in the past, that means the clocks are wrong and therefore we can't trust these radioactive dating methods. But the interesting thing is the methods still give the similar relative ages. In other words, rocks down the bottom of the geologic record give older ages than rocks at the top. And that's exactly what we'd expect during the flood. The rocks laid down early in the flood should give you older ages than the rocks at the top at the end of the flood. So whichever way we look at it, radioactive dating, while, it, we can't, while it's inaccurate, there may yet be a way of, of using it to confirm what we always knew from our starting, uh, from the starting point we have of God's word. Okay, evidence three, abundant fission tracks. We look at volcanic ash beds at the bottom of Grand Canyon. We see limestone. And we also see zircon grains that contain uranium atoms. And uranium atom is so large that over time it can become unstable unable to hold itself together, so it decays. Occasionally some uranium atoms eject particles from their nuclei. Very rarely the nuclei of other uranium atoms will split and two halves of the atoms fly apart. This is the basis of the atomic bomb with the splitting atoms. This nuclear decay process is called fission. Two halves physically separate and then when they're inside of the zircon crystal they'll actually show the damage under a microscope this da these damage trails can be seen you can see these damage trails here on this uh, damaged zircon crystal it's called fission tracks and more and more uranium atoms split or fission more and more fission tracks are produced and we see this in examples all across the world. In Peachtree, Tuff, and Arizona, we see fission tracks. And you can measure this at today's rate. And that equals 21 million worth, years worth of nuclear decay at today's fission rate. I'm not saying that this is showing 21 million years of the world. No, we're saying that we are seeing evidence of decaying, nuclear decay, with the fission tracks showing 21 years worth of decay but this actually these deposits were put here during the flood also in the morrison formation tuff in utah we see fission tracks equal to 136 million years of nuclear de decay at today's fission rate in the tapete sandstone the tuff in arizona fission tracks up to 500 million years worth of nuclear decay at today's measured rate so abundant fission tracks up to 500 million years worth at today's fission rate occur in zircon grains within volcanic ash beds in the Grand Canyon. Fission track ages match radioisotope ages of these rock layers. So conclusions, these abundant fission tracks in the rocks are observable physical evidence that abundant nuclear decay up to 500 million years worth accord uh, occurred during the accumulation of these rock layers during the year of the flood and nuclear decay had to be rapidly accelerated during the flood evidence number four uranium and polonium radio halos most granites contain black flaky mica mineral called biotite and you can get that from like granite in California, east of San Diego. And embedded within this black biotite flakes are tiny zircon crystals. And zircon crystals contain radioactive uranium atoms. And uranium nu nucleus decays, ejecting an alpha particle. To there's a total of eight decay steps, with uranium atom uh, giving daughter elements step one an alpha particle another daughter element step two another alpha particle and six more decay steps until it finally leads to a stable lead atom as the daughter element 
We talked about this in the first evidence. When zircon crystals are large, 60 microns long, the alpha particles stay within the zircon crystals and become helium atoms. However, when the zircon crystals are tiny, like say one micron long, the alpha particles are ejected out of the zircon crystal into the surrounding biotite flakes. And it's similar to firing a gun and having a hole in your drywall. And what happens is the ejected alpha particles are like tiny bullets, which damage the crystal structure of the surrounding biotite, discoloring it. And it forms a sphere or a radioactive halo or radio halo for short. And this is physical evidence of abundant radioactive decay. These alpha particles ejected at each of the decay steps form rings. And these, think of bullets, circular bullets, uh, travel different distances, producing eight different rings in uranium radio, radio halo. And here is an example of a fully formed dark uranium radi radio halo with eight rings. And this requires 500 million to a billion alpha particles, equivalent to 100 plus million years worth of radioactive to get decay measured at today's rates. Not saying it's that old, it's what's measured at today's rates. And we see this uranium radio halos in granites around the world with these dark uh, halos. We see it in England in the granite. We see it at Stone Mountain in Georgia. And these are equivalent to 100 million years worth of radioactive decay measured again at today's rate. But they're located in flood sediments. Therefore, they had to occur during the flood in one year. And in many granites, the biotite flakes are found with radio halos consisting of one small ring next to the very dark uranium radio halos. So we have a dark uranium and a radio halo with one small ring. So what are those? Well, we see another example of a, uranium, a very dark uranium radio halo with a radio halo with two rings. And here's one next to it with three rings. Well, what are these? These radio halos were produced by the last three alpha decay steps parented by polonium. So uranium uh, decays to polonium, the last three decay steps. One, two, three. These polonium radio halos are found with uranium radio halos from many granites around the world. It's not an isolated event. We found evidence of this many places. We found it in La Pasta granite east of San Diego and others as well. The only nearby source is the uranium as it decays to polonium in the zircons. So here's a uranium radio halo and here's a polonium radio halo, both 214 and 210. It is generating the uranium radio halos in the same biotite flakes. So they had to form at the same time. So uranium decay must deliver enough polonium to generate one billion worth of particles for each dark polonium radio halo before the polonium decays. This is the most interesting piece. How fast does the polonium decay? Polonium 218, 3.1 minutes. Polonium 214, 164 microseconds, or as fast as you can blink, it decays. And polonium 210, 138 days. So we have over 100 million years worth of decay occurring while you blinked during the flood. So the rate conclusions were, we have coexisting uranium and polonium and many granites around the world, and they had to form at the same time. So here is observable physical evidence of abundant nuclear decay occurred at an accelerated rate or during the single year of the flood. And then evidence number five, measurable radiocarbon in fossils. By show of hands, um, has anybody heard of radiocarbon or carbon-14 dating methods? Okay, yeah. Has anyone not seen this? 
So it sounds like everyone has. Okay, good. So radiocarbon and fossils. Radiocarbon or carbon-14 is formed in the upper atmosphere. We have cosmic rays hitting the neutrons and hitting nitrogen, and it turns into radiocarbon-14. And cosmic rays collide with nitrogen to form it. So here's another example. Cosmic rays of radiation collide with nitrogen, which has an atomic weight of 14 and 14, and forms carbon-14. And then the carbon-14 combines with oxygen to form carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide, all living animals breathe it in. And also uh, plants take carbon dioxide in. So basically we are radioactive carbon-14 in our bodies because we're breathing and eating. But it, you know, I wouldn't worry, it's not, too, it's not dangerous. But here, the cosmic radiation hits the nitrogen, that converts it to carbon-14, and eventually carbon-14 decays into nitrogen-14. But how long does this decay process take when the carbon-14 goes back to nitrogen? Well, observational detection limit is 0.001% of the present level of carbon, so equivalent to 95,000 years at today's rates. So that means there should be no organic material, whether it's fossils, coal, or even diamonds, greater than 95,000 years, meaning they shouldn't have any detectable radiocarbon if they're supposedly greater than 95,000 years, because that's when all the C14 is not detectable or gone out of existing organic material. So there, this is the reason why secular scientists do not use radiocarbon to date fossils for millions of years, because it only goes out to 95,000 years. But secular scientists have started finding biological samples that have up to 540 million year old dates to them. And, this, and they have detectable measurable radiocarbon. And this has been actually published in secular journals like the Journal of Radiocarbon and other secular journals. And this is according to Dr. Andrew Snelling. So they are saying that even though they're supposedly 550 million years old, they still found detectable, measurable carbon-14 radiocarbon in these samples. Here's one, material from layers where dinosaurs are found with carbon dated at 34,000 years old. Of course, we know this. In the previous lesson, we talked about dinosaurs even live with man, and most of the dinosaurs, the fossil record occurred during the flood. So here's a quick video of carbon-14 in the bones, un unlocking the mysterious mys mysteries of Genesis from ICR. So maybe there are flaws in the ways that scientists calculate the age of things. If you go to practically any museum of natural history, they'll tell you that dinosaur fossils are tens of millions of years old. But how can they be sure? The contradiction, though, is that you have these specimens, coal, uh, wood, even dinosaur bones, that are supposed to be tens or even hundreds of millions of years old, and yet there's still detectable carbon-14 in them. And that just should not be the case. And we think this is illustrating that one of the key assumptions of the method is wrong, the assumption that the decay rates have been constant. Because if you assume that the decay rates have been constant throughout Earth history, you will get millions and billions of years for those dates. But that very assumption leads to a contradiction. If the decay rates have been constant throughout history, then those fossils really are millions of years old. And there should not be any carbon-14 in them, or at least none that we can detect. But there is. And so that's telling us, we think, that there's a problem with the method. There you go. That's a good summary of what I just discussed. Okay, evidence five, radiocarbon and fossils. The rate group selected 10 coal samples taken from three geologic ages, the Cenozoic, Mesozoic, and Paleozoic. And the assumed ages range from 34 to 311 million years. And they got the samples obtained from the U.S. Department of Energy Coal Bank. And the analysis utilized the storage unit located at Penn State University. 
And these are the different coal samples they used. And the different states were Texas, Montana, Utah, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Illinois. And they had the different, like I mentioned, between 34 million year old coal, supposedly to up to 318 million year old coal. So what did they find when they did the testing? They sent it to a secular test facility to see if there was radiocarbon in the coal. All 10 coal samples contained similar amounts of radiocarbon, regardless of their conventional ages. The 10 samples had about the same radiocarbon age. Despite them, the range from 34 to 311 million years old. And when was this formed? In the global flood in the one year. The pre-flood world trees were covered up and saturated and condensed and formed coal. So here's your observational science evidence showing there's still radiocarbon in these coal samples and they're not that old. They also looked at diamonds. Does anyone know what diamonds are made of? Yeah, here. Okay, carbon. Exactly. So the rate group tested six African diamond samples for radiocarbon analysis. And the age of the diamonds are assumed to be one to three billion years old because they, they exist deep in the Earth's crust. And diamonds are the hardest substance on Earth. Therefore, there should not be any radiocarbon in them. They don't get contaminated, and they're too old to have any left. Remember, radiocarbon only exists for things that are less than 95,000 years old. What did they find? They found similar amounts. Oops, this is about the coal. Um, I'll go over this. Found similar amounts of measurable radiocarbon in the coal samples, regardless of the sum ages, and the coal represents the pre-flood plants buried during the flood. Therefore, it's not surprising that the coal dates had the same radiocarbon age of 48 to 50,000 years. In the diamonds, the six diamonds tested, they found similar small amounts of measurable radiocarbon in all six samples. Therefore, the diamonds are thousands, not billions of years old. And according to conventional dating, they cannot have radiocarbon because they're supposedly one to three billion years old, and they're found 200 miles down in the mantle from explosive volcanic action at the start of the creation of the Earth. And the diamonds are the hardest nosed substance and are impervious to contamination. Here's a short uh, video from ICR, Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis on Carbon-14 Dating Summary. But what about Carbon-14, the method that most people are familiar with? Well, first of all, carbon-14 is used to date the remains of dead plants and animals and not rocks directly. Carbon is present in every living thing. Carbon has three isotopes. Carbon-12 and carbon-13 are stable, but carbon-14 is radioactive. Carbon-14 decays into nitrogen-14 with a half-life of about 5,730 years, meaning half of it will disappear in that time. Plants take in atmospheric carbon. Animals eat the plants, and this introduces carbon-14 into their bodies. As long as the organism lives, it replenishes the amount of carbon-14 in its body, and the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 remains constant. After the plant or animal dies, the carbon-14 in its cells decays back to nitrogen without being replaced while the carbon-12 and a tiny amount of carbon-13 remains. The amount of carbon-14 as compared to the total amount of carbon in an organism will yield a calculated time since the organism stopped absorbing carbon-14. This age estimate is the calculated time since the organism's death and thus the calculated approximate age of the specimen. But an astonishing discovery, this time made by the secular scientific community over the last 30 years, is that carbon-14 is routinely found at significant levels in fossils that are supposedly tens to hundreds of millions of years old. But compared to those time scales, C14 is like a flash in the pan. There should be no carbon-14 detectable in any living thing older than 100,000 years, or a tenth of a million years. 
What this implies is that all fossils are not millions of years old, but only thousands. And all the sediment-bearing layers of rock are only thousands of years old and not millions, including these we see in the Grand Canyon. And this implies that the Grand Canyon almost certainly has to be the product of the year-long Genesis flood just a few thousand years ago. So the conclusions for radiocarbon and fossils, all the coal layers formed at the same time, and it happened to the pre-flood plant materials buried during the flood. The deep earth diamonds formed at the same time as the earth itself. Therefore, the earth is young. Also, conclusions, the uncalibrated radiocarbon ages confirm the biblical time scale for young earth in the recent Genesis flood. The conventional ages of millions and billions of years are due to the decay of long-age radioisotopes like uranium and potassium, etc., that were rapidly accelerated during the events in the recent past, like the global flood. So let's how are we turning this foe into our friend? Recalibrating the radiocarbon clock. The radiocarbon production is controlled by cosmic ray influx. This in turn is controlled by the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field was twice as strong 1,400 years ago. Remember we talked about this several months ago, about the magnetic field is decaying, weakening, and it may almost go away in the next maybe 1,000 years. I forgot the date, but it was twice as strong 1,400 years ago and even stronger back in the flood. Therefore, radiocarbon production rate was only one half of what it is today. So recalibrating the radio, radiocarbon clock with huge volume of pre-flood biosphere carbon buried during the flood that contained 100 times more carbon than we see today. Therefore, the trivial radiocarbon that we find in these fossils in coal has to be grossly diluted by all the normal carbon. So recalibrating the radiocarbon clock. Coal beds, conventional radiocarbon ages of 50,000 years are grossly overestimated due to the burial of plants during the flood, dropping the uniformitarian assumption that these radiocarbon ages, then they shrink to 5,000 years. The result, this provides accurate dates when the plants and animals were alive just before the flood. Also, we can devise a recalibration factor or dating scheme for radiocarbon age calculations consistent with the biblical time frame of Earth history, and this would then become an invaluable ally to Christians. Conclusions Three radioactive dating assumptions we stated at the beginning are not provable because the past cannot be observed, measured, tested. They're, these assumptions aren't even reasonable. Number two, resultant millions of years ages, though unreliable and highly inflated compared to the 6,000 year biblical time frame, usually still match the relevant order and relevant relative ages the rock units dated. Because during the flood, the older rocks settled first and they should be relatively older, like a few months or up to a year more than this, the uh, rock layers that are on top during the flood. Three, the rate research uncovered five independent lines of evidences that demonstrate radioactive decay rates must have been rapidly accelerated during the recent global flood. Therefore, radioactive dating methods cannot accurately date rocks and fossils with absolute millions of year ages. And here's a quick clip from the movie is Genesis History and talks about incorrect dating and how creationists are working to come up with their correct dating method using the Bible. If the fossils of dinosaurs have been dated incorrectly, then it's very likely the fossils of any organism been dated incorrectly, and therefore then the geologic ages themselves are incorrect. Okay. Conclusion number five. Measurable radiocarbon in fossils in deep earth diamonds is consistent with a young earth in the recent Genesis flood. Remember we found... We found carbon-14 in the diamonds, and it designates a young earth. 
Number six, continuing research into this correction factor for the long age parent-daughter isotope dating systems and the recalibration of the radiocarbon dates will transform these methods from a foe to our friend. And I'll close with some Bible verses, Romans 1, 18 and 19. Eight, Romans 1, 18 states, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Who, what? Suppress the truth through unrighteousness. For what may be known about God is clear to them, since God has shown it to them. Comments? The creation evidence is clearly seen to the secular scientists. Unrighteous men deliberately suppress the truth. This is what is happening in our public education system. They are deliberately suppressing the true scientific evidence so our youth will continue to believe in evolution. 1 Timothy 6.20 Paul tells Timothy, O oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to you to your trust. Avoid the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Our youth are taught false knowledge in the public school systems at all levels, including college. They're also getting false knowledge in many of our Christian colleges and universities and some churches I showed even last lesson last week. Timothy was called to guard the truth against all false teachings. Christians should guard against false teachings. We have too much apathy today going along with what the world teaches. We have lost our passion. We should guard God's word against all these false teachings. And we'll close with 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5. I charge you therefore God, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine, but they will gather to themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires, having itching ears. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn to myths, like evolution. But be self-controlled in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and prove your ministry. The end. Any questions?